All right, church, come on, let's stand one more time. One more time for the reading of God's Word today. I want to invite you to get your Bibles and your notes ready and turn to Exodus chapter 25, second book in the Bible, if you're new to that. So during the month of August, we're taking you on a journey, like I just said, to get you closer to God. Am I, is, that, is this the right church to want to get closer to God? In this? And so I want you to experience the power and the presence of God on a whole new level. And, and I, I truly I want this so bad. I want the Avenue Church to live under an open heaven. I want to live under an open heaven. And so let's look at Exodus 25, 1 through 9, verse, and also verse 40, our foundational text for this series. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering <clears throat> for me from everyone whose heart prompts them <clears throat> to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, ram skins dyed red, spices, and another type of durable leather, acacia wood, olive oil for the, for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, and onyx stones and other gems be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. That's our prayer, that the Lord will dwell among us. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Verse 40. See that you make them according to the pattern shown you on the mountain because God is a God of details and there's a reason why he wanted it made a certain way. We'll talk about it. So if you're taking notes real quick, write this down. The title of the message today is The Slaughterhouse. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, welcome to the slaughterhouse. Welcome to the slaughterhouse. Come on, let's pray together. And while we pray, let's also lift up another church in our area like we do every Sunday. Father, we thank you so much. For this incredible day, thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in this house. Lord, we, we have a, obviously an order and a plan of how we feel like things should go throughout any service. But, Lord, we, we thank you that you come sometimes and just mess it all up. And we're just grateful for that, Lord. Um, we're, we're not here on our time. We're on your time. And we're grateful that you would allow us into your presence. And, Lord, we just take a moment right now and, and lift up another local church body. And, God, we pray for the, the First Baptist Church in Jefferson City. And, Lord, as a church right now, they're searching for a pastor to lead them. And we just pray that you would give them guidance and wisdom. And Lord, will you raise up the right person that's supposed to fulfill that position for this church? And I pray that you would close every wrong door and open every right one for them. God, I pray you give them wisdom. And uh, Lord, I pray you lead them, protect them. Lord, I pray that you would breathe the power of your Holy Spirit fresh and new in that church. And God, I pray that lives are changed and souls are saved and people are set free and people hear the gospel and come and have their whole life changed for you, Lord. Let that, let that church know how much you love them and how proud of them you are, God. And I thank you for this place. God, thank you for what you're doing at the Avenue Church. And we give you all the glory and honor for it, God. And we welcome you in our lives over the next few moments. Speak to us and challenge us through your word because your word is life-giving and life-changing and it's in Jesus name we pray come on somebody say a big amen. amen amen you may be seated you may be seated so we're in a series called the protocol somebody say protocol, protocol. and it is a walkthrough of the Old Testament tabernacle that God instructed Moses to build and there's there's so much meaning and symbolism to this tabernacle thing that I, I could spend a long time um, picking it all apart but we're just gonna go with what we feel the Holy Spirit is wanting us to know is that cool so here's what you do need to know about the purpose of the tabernacle so that we're all on the same page God created man and Adam and Eve they ended up falling to sin and from that moment, man started to drift further and further away from God. So the tabernacle was a place it designed where humanity and divinity could meet. Cool? We good? We, we said this last week, just a refresher. Because of our sin, come on, look at your neighbor and say, thank you for that. Because of our sin, something had to be done to get us back to God. So the tabernacle was a prototype of what was to come in Jesus. And the Bible actually shows us in Hebrews chapter 8 that the tabernacle was a type and shadow of the real thing in heaven and the final solution being Jesus. Meaning the tabernacle was in the Old Testament what Christ is in the New Testament. So understand this. The tabernacle is a prototype of what was in heaven. It, it's how man got back to God. And Jesus came and fulfilled the tabernacle, the prototype. But please get this. The protocol, the order, still applies today. 
Let, let's look at it just to kind of refresh it. If you bring up that diagram, this is what it looked like. So we talked last week about this is the way, right? The gate. There was one gate to the tabernacle, and everybody came in the same gate. Now, everybody was welcome to come in the gate, but not everybody was allowed to go any further. If you were not a priest, coming in the gate was the only place that you could go. Only the priest could do everything else. And so it's separated into the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. The inner court, also known as the most holy place, and then you got the, the Holy of Holies. So you'll hear it reference different, different things. The outer court, the holy place, the most holy place, or the Holy of Holies. You'll see patterns, patterns of three. We talked about the gate last week. We're going to spend some time in the outer court talking about the brazen altar today and the laver. And you're thinking, are we going to start making sacrifices at the Avenue Church? That's why we're talking about it, because that's a prototype, but we're talking about the the protocol you with me so you'll notice a pattern of three I want to show that other picture an animated view of what kind of what we're talking about of what it kind of looked like and you'll see the brazen altar or the altar of sacrifice on the bottom left there and then the labor you'll see just past that and that's what we're going to talk about today and they kind of put a, a real life version of what this would look like in the desert and that's exactly what kind of what it would look like all right you ready so in the tabernacle and in the Bible, I want you to see something. There's a pattern of three heavily all throughout the Bible, meaning divine completion. It's a type and shadow. So on, in, around the, the tabernacle, you had the 12 tribes of, of, of Israel, and, and they were separated into threes. You got three to the north, three to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. Pattern of three. Inside, there was an outer, an inner, and holy of holies. Pattern of three. We've got F God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Pattern of three. The angels are known to sing holy, 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 pattern of three. They sing worthy, worthy, worthy in patterns of three. Y'all with me? Seven is the number of completion here on earth, but three is the number for divine completion, declaring it's done. What do you mean? Outer, inner, holy of holies. How, how many days did Jesus spend in the grave? Jesus stayed down three, but we know that he got back up. But in other words, when you get to mercy, God is declaring that the sin that was destroying your life no longer controls over you. Come on, somebody shout, it's done. it's done. So last week, we started at the gate, right? This protocol still applies today. Today. Just because we went through the gate last week doesn't mean that's the last time we go through the gate. Come on. There's, there's, a, there's a protocol Psalm 100 verse 4 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. There's a, there's a protocol. That's why we started the worship service off with praise and giving thanks. Like, like how many parents we have out here? Any parents? Any proud parents? Okay, just making sure the same hand stayed up. How many of you parents know sometimes you come, you come home and, and if, if you're anything like my household, and I love my kids, and I'm pretty sure they love me, but there, there's, there's times I've come home, and it's not like, I like to be greeted as, a, like, as, the, as the priest of the home, as the dad, like, hey, dad, I love you so much. I couldn't believe you're gone this long today. I missed you so very much. You're the greatest dad in the whole entire world. I cannot believe that God allowed me to have you as a dad. Dad, you're home. <laughs> wow. Dad, you're awesome. But a lot of times I'll, I'll come in and they won't hear me at all. An hour later, they'll make a, when'd you get home? Or they'll come, come, come down immediately, they heard the garage door open, they come running down. Hey, Dad, what's for dinner? Where are we going? Like, hey, son, hey, daughter, it's so nice to see you today. Thank you for thinking of me. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Formality. Like, I, I, just, I, I appreciate when somebody takes the time to go, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Right? Like when I text people, if I hadn't texted you in a minute, I'm probably not going to just say, hey, can you come help me, blah, 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 blah. I'm probably going to say, hey there, I hope you're doing well. Hope life's doing, you know, great things in you. And by the way, can you, like, I, I, I'm big on like, hey, hey, instead of just saying, gimme, gimme. You know what I'm talking about? So with God, I, I think sometimes we become too comfortable. And, and God is showing us that we need to enter in the right way. If we would just come in the gate the right way, follow the protocol, and be thankful and start off with praise, that alone would fix the majority of our problems. So, so we enter the gate with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. Can I, can I take a second and just say something right here? Notice something about the tabernacle. There, there are no chairs. Why? 
The priests were to serve and worship God at all times. There were no chairs in the tabernacle because God wanted there to be continual worship in his house. Can I go there today? I know I haven't set this thing up all the way yet, but can I preach for a second? Come on. See, before you have a purpose to do anything else in this life, you were created to be a worshiper. Oh, come on. Will you go with me today? Before I'm a husband, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm a father, I'm a worshiper. Before I'm even a pastor, I'm a, I'm a worshiper. Come on, touch your neighbor and tell them you're a worshiper. You're a worshiper. Here's what I'm saying. Who do we think we are to come to church and just sit there spectating during the worship service? Well, I don't have to sing and I don't have, you know, I don't have to lift my hands and, and I don't have to shout and I don't have to do all that. But we sure do expect God to hear us when we want something. See, I believe the reason why some of us have so many unanswered prayers is because we've, we, we think God is our puppet and we've scared the protocol we must enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise oh come on somebody help me enter the right way today come on you'll find out if you'll begin to praise him you'll attract his attention he'll rise up and come close to you in fact i'm going to give you another opportunity today to enter the right way come on somebody take a moment and give god your best praise somebody help me Enter the right way today. Woo! Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, high five your neighbor. Tell him this is the way. This is, this is the way. This is the way. So today, I had to set it up. So today, we're looking at the altar and the laver. And at the altar, someone or something has to die. Some, something's got to die. Exodus 27, 1 through 8 says, Build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It's to be square, five cubits long, five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns in the altar are of one piece and overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. Make, make a grating for it, a bronze network, and make, a, and make a, a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it's halfway up the altar. Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the ring so they will be on the two sides of the altar when it's carried. Make the altar hollow out of boards. It's to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. It was on the altar that a sacrifice had to be made. A spotless lamb had to be sacrificed in order for your sins to be forgiven. Now notice something. There's only two altars in the tabernacle. The brazen altar, the altar of sacrifice, and then the altar of incense, okay? Two altars, brazen altar, altar of incense. It's another type and shadow. Two is the number of Jesus. I'll explain that in just a minute. Well, why did you have to come to the tabernacle? And why did you have to come to the altar? According to Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, if you were going to come to the tabernacle and bring your sacrifice to be forgiven of your sins, you had to find your best lamb, a spotless lamb, one without any defect. What what have I been telling you about the tabernacle? It's a type and shadow of the real thing. And Jesus came to as the real thing to fulfill the prototype. Has anybody ever heard of Jesus being referred to as the Lamb of God? But do you truly and fully know why? why? Why do you call him the Lamb of God? Check this. When they finally built it in a permanent location called the Tabernacle in the Promised Land, they would bring spotless lambs that were raised in Bethlehem to be used for sacrificial sin offerings. And they would bring them up through the valley up on the east side of the temple where they would go through the eastern gate or the sheep gate which is next to it. Is it any wonder that Jesus who was born in Bethlehem on Palm Sunday one week before crucifixion, Jesus the spotless lamb was brought up on a donkey on the east side into the city at the east gate. Some would even 
even argue through the sheep gate. Why? To fulfill the tabernacle. Scripture says in John chapter 1 verse 29, Behold, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I'm trying to tell you today that Jesus is the spotless Lamb who came to take away all of your sins. No longer do you have to go by the prototype, but we must still go through the protocol. Come on. Jesus, he is he is the protocol. Jesus is the way to get to the Father. Come on, somebody. He became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. And because of Jesus, you and I had the promise of heaven. And it's only through Jesus that you can be brought back. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And I've come to shout it out today. Jesus is the only way to God's presence and Jesus is the only way you get to heaven. Come on, if you're thankful for the Savior, give God a big praise right there. Woo! But why the word altar? The Hebrew word for altar is mezbeah. It means to lift up, to slaughter. But, but we want to make altars look really pretty. We, we want to make crosses look really pretty. But nothing about the altar is pretty. Bring the lamb. Slit its throat. Bleed it out. Kill it. I'm not talking about just one. Many, lots of screaming, slit the throat, bleed it out, kill it. It was bloody and it was smelly, church. Hey, Avenue, here's what I'm trying to tell you today. Something has to die at the altar. Can y'all handle this this morning? When you come to the altar, spiritually speaking, the old you has to die so God can make you new. Come on, church. I don't, I don't give a flying rip how you feel about a situation. I don't care how you feel about racism. I don't care how you feel about drugs and alcohol. I don't care how you feel about your gender. I don't care how you feel about your preference. The old you has to die so that God can make you new. Whatever it is that's not lining up with God's word in your life must die. Hear me today, church. We've got to find the altar today. If you want to get to heaven, get to the altar. If you want life and not death, get to the altar. Come on, touch your neighbor. Tell them something's got to die. Some, something's got to die. My addicted self has to die so I can get back up set free. My shame has to die. My guilt has to die. My pride has to die. My sin has to die so I can be victorious. The problem is some of you have come to the altar to lay down your life so you can get forgiveness, but you let your sacrifice live because you enjoyed your sin a little too much. Hey, church. Something's got to die at the altar. The old you has to die. It's time for you to lay down the pride of the past. It's time for you to kill the past. It's time for you to lay down the addiction. It's time to lay down the gossip. It's time to lay down the lies. Oh, I'm declaring that today is the day that your past is erased so you can step into God's purpose for your life. Come on, slap your neighbor. Tell him, welcome to the slaughterhouse, baby. Welcome. Welcome to the slaughterhouse. We see, we see, the problem we have in 2023 is we've got a bunch of people who want to follow Jesus but not give up anything. Yeah, I, want, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to give up my life. That, that's not, that's, op, that's anti-gospel. I, I know, i got to hurry. Welcome to the slaughterhouse. Two, two pieces of furniture in the outer court. The brazen altar, the laver. And one leads to the other, but it starts with the altar. You, you don't go any further until you go through the altar. Here, here's what you need to know for this to make sense. Don't freak out. I got four things I want to tell you, but I, that was like a lot of it. Okay, so don't, don't freak out. The brazen altar was in the Old Testament what the cross of Jesus is in the New Testament. 
The brazen altar was in the Old Testament what the New Testament, I'm sorry, what the cross is in the New Testament. So, so three things about the altar and just one about the labor. Here we go. Number one, write this down real quick. The altar teaches you how to worship. We've made so much of worship about us today, it makes me want to puke. I'm, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to that church. I don't like the way they worship. I, I, I don't like their style of music. That's just not how I want to worship. The, the altar teaches you how to worship. In the Old Testament, bringing a lamb to the altar, God would accept a substitute of where you should have been. Slit the neck, tie it to the altar, bleed it out, lay the flesh aside, separate the fat. Because God said the fat belonged to God. Glory, hallelujah. That's Bible. The fat belonged to God. Slip the neck, put on the altar, bleed it out, separate the flesh and the fat. Then you have to wait. Now follow me here, church. It's here that you're able to worship. How am I supposed to worship killing this animal, Pastor? You're waiting for your sacrifice to be burnt at the altar. And while you're waiting, you would have taken some of the blood from the animal and you would splash the blood on the horns of the altar where the sacrifice was tied up. That's how you would worship. Why? Because it's the blood at the altar that reminds us of the price that was paid in order for us to have forgiveness. And our response is simply to worship. It was there at the gate, at the front of the altar, that you would spend some time splashing the blood on the altar, giving thanks to God that you were being restored back to him because of the B L O O. D. Oh, I think you know where I'm going with this. Just like the animal that was tied up to the altar, so too was Jesus crucified and tied to the altar. And I've come to tell somebody today that the blood of Jesus that was poured out on the cross has never lost its power. And it's because of the blood of Jesus that you and I can worship today. It's the blood that helps us worship and washes away our sin. I'm going old school today. And I wish I could find some people who's thankful for the blood of Jesus because in 2023 the blood is still the answer there's still power in the blood there's still freedom in the blood there's still healing in the blood there's still hope and victory in the blood come on you can sit there and look cute if you want to but when I think about Jesus and all that he's done for me I can't help but to give my praise on because he's forgiven me of my past. Come on. Somebody give God a big shout of praise. Yeah. Woo. Come on. High five your whole zip code and tell them it's still the blood, baby. It's still, it's still the blood. It's still the blood. It's still the blood. It's still the blood. Don't, don't ever get so new school that you don't forget old school. It's the blood. Welcome to the slaughterhouse. When you get to the altar, the altar teaches you how to worship. Here's a second one. Number two, the altar gives life when you actually deserve death. The altar gives life when you actually deserve death. The altar made of acacia wood and carried by two poles. Why? Here again, a type and shadow of the real thing, a type and shadow of what was to come with the wooden cross of Jesus. And so upon this wooden altar, a sacrifice was tied to the horns of the altar to die in place of our sins. God would accept the death of a substitute, but the animal only pacified God. It wasn't until the blood of his own son that he would be satisfied. I feel like preaching. Today. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. 
But the gift of God is life in Christ Jesus our Lord. At the altar, someone has to die. It should have been me. It should have been you. In the Old Testament, it was a spotless lamb. But in the New Testament, it was the spotless lamb. In the tabernacle, two altars. Two pieces of furniture in the outer court. The Bible refers to Jesus as being the second man coming after the original Adam. He is the second in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Two is the number for Jesus. Is it any wonder? That when they carried the altar, they carried it with two wooden poles, a type and shadow. They had to carry this altar everywhere that they went. But when Jesus came, he carried the altar once and for all and lifted the burden of our sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He was he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Hey, 1 Timothy 2, 5-6 through six says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Here's what I'm say in church because of our sin it should have been us on the altar but God accepted a substitute because God loved us so much he sent us his son to die in our place he became the ultimate sacrifice in exchange for our sin Jesus died on the cross so you and I could be set free from our sin and have a promise of eternity in heaven come on if you're thankful give God a big praise right there Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It was not the nails that held him on the cross. It was not the ropes that held him on the cross. It was the joy of knowing that you and I could be free. The altar is the starting point of grace. It represents the cross. Newsflash. When we were at our worst, God was at his best. He died so you could be free from depression. He died so you could be free from addiction. He died so you could be free from sorrow. He died so you could be free from sickness. Come on. He died so you could be free from sin. Anybody thankful that Jesus died just for you? just for you if you were the only one he'd do it all over again just for you for God so loved Justin Graham that he gave his only son and if he would just believe he would not perish and have everlasting life he did it for me he did it for you Come on, when you get to the altar, it teaches you how to worship. It gives life when you actually deserve death. Here's a third one. The altar offers forgiveness to be free from your past. The altar offers forgiveness to be free from your past. So you've brought your sacrifice. You worship because of the blood. You worship because the sacrifice is setting you free. And then, I love this right here. This is so good. You ready? Come on, you ready? I'm doing good right now. I'm flying through this thing. I'm proud of myself. You, you, you would wait on the ashes. The priest would give you a cup of leftover ash to take home with you. But why? Many times in the Bible, you'll hear of people putting on sackcloth and ashes during a difficult season of their life. They would signify to others that they had been struggling with something by wearing sackcloth. Wait for it. They would take some of the ashes that came from the altar and put it on their forehead to testify that they'd been forgiven. And that God was helping them work through it. In other words, the altar is your testimony. Because the ashes from the altar were showing other people that you'd been forgiven. Is it any wonder why the Bible tells us that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony? The sackcloth says, I'm burdened. But the ashes from the altar was saying to everybody else, God's got this. 
I may be going through something, but because of the altar, I'm wearing my praise. Is there anybody wearing their praise today? Are you wearing? And today, I can receive forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross. And now, I have a testimony. I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. I used to be an addict, but I'm covered. I used to sleep around, but I'm covered. I used to gossip, but I'm covered. I used to disrespect people, but I'm covered. I used to stab people in the back, but I'm covered. I used to be bitter, but I'm covered. I used to be a drunk, but I'm covered. I used to hate people, but I'm covered. I used to be broke, busted, jacked up, and whacked out, but because of the work of the cross, because of the work of the altar, I'm forgiven. I may be going through something, but because of Jesus, I'm wearing my praise and the cross declares I'm covered. Oh, I need you to touch three people and tell them I'm covered. I'm covered. I'm covered. Depression may try to bring me down, but I'm covered. Fear may try to cripple me, but I'm covered. Anxiety may try to lock me up, but I'm covered. Sin may try to destroy me, but I'm covered. Temptation may try to stop me, but I'm covered. My past may try to creep back on me, but I'm covered. Oh, I'm talking to some people that you've got a rap sheet a mile long, and you're thankful today that you've been covered by the blood of the Lamb, and you have a testimony. Come on, if you've got a testimony today, give God a big shout of praise. Slap somebody, tell them we're covered, we're covered, we're covered, we're covered. Can, can, I, can, I, can I take it one step further? There was an old Brooklyn Tabernacles. Covered, covered, covered by the blood, walking by faith. Uh. Y'all know about that. I told y'all, I, I got old school with me. Five tools used at the altar. Pans to receive the ash. Basins caught the blood. Flesh hooks to remove the sacrifice that was big. Fire pans that you'd take the coals on and off the altar. And shovels. So you could remove the excess ash. I practiced last night and this morning. Made sure I said excess ash right. Because if I didn't get it right, it was going to be an immediate dismissal. But sometimes you got to shovel that out as well. Pastor, I can't believe you said that. You were thinking it, so I went ahead and said it. And plus, if I was reading King James, who would have said it? For all you sanctified people. Anybody like to grill? If you know anything about grilling, in order for you to have a fresh fire, fresh charcoal to be able to have a, a good grilling experience, you have to remove the old excess ash. Because you have to have oxygen to flow in there for the fire to be able to be right. And if you have too much excess ash, then you don't have a good fire. It would it'll actually put your fire out. Some of y'all can't be on fire for Jesus because you've got too much excess ash in your life. Mm, I, there's something on that right there. I don't know who I'm talking to today. Ah, but what God has forgiven, stop bringing back up and letting your past hold you back from your destiny. Amen. Who's that for today? Come on. If you've got some stuff in your life that you know you need to leave behind, I'm talking to you. You need to leave it behind so you can step into your purpose and step into your destiny and stop using your excess ash as a crutch to keep you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Amen. 
they, they, they were instructed to take out the excess ash and don't bring it back. God, I know you want to use me and all. But you know what I used to be. And here you go again, bringing up excess ash. Or maybe you don't bring it up to God, but you bring it up to everybody else. All the time. Y'all know, I used to, yeah, we know, we know. You, well, I know, here we go again, tell it again, yeah, I don't know. You've given us 17 reasons why you can't. 17 reasons why you won't. Why you're disqualified. Why we should feel bad for you. You keep bringing your excess ash into every single conversation. Carefully look at the neighbor and say, leave the ash behind. I said careful. Now, if you cuss this, then that's your problem. Now, knowing that somebody else has been to the altar like you, and the ashes have been taken out, I love this, the altar is where judgment ends and grace begins. Newsflash. The avenue is a judgment-free place. Why? Because I know what I've been through, and I know the mistakes that I've made, so how dare I judge anybody else that ever walks through those doors? I've come to put everybody on notice. This is not a place of judgment, but this is a house of restoration, a house of love, a house of healing, a house of grace, a house of forgiveness. Come on. At the avenue, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've done and who you've done it with. There's room at the cross for you to find grace and freedom and forgiveness. Come on, somebody shout a big amen. Amen. Come on, high five four people you may not know and tell them this is the place where you belong. This is the place where you belong. Here's the last one and I'm done. Here's the last one. When you get to the altar, you learn how to worship, you discover freedom, you receive forgiveness. Here's the last one. Number four, the labor prepares your heart to serve God. Just one thing, just one thing about the labor. Don't miss it. One thing. The labor prepares your heart to serve God. So the labor prepares your heart to serve God. Exodus 30, 17 to 21. It's the last thing I'll share with you. The Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin with his bronze stand for washing. Place, in it, place it between the tent of meeting and the altar. Put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water. Why? So that they will not die. Also, When they approach the altar to ministry by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. See, I know Jesus came and fulfilled all this, and we can go to God because of Jesus. But this this is why I get upset with people who dishonor the presence of God and treat Jesus like their homeboy. I appreciate that Jesus said he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother, but Jesus ain't my homeboy. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if nobody else wants to restore reverence to the presence of God, the Avenue Church is going to restore reverence to the presence of God. We serve a holy God. See, the the labor was for cleansing and preparation. It was a time for you to check your heart unless you wanted to die. I I said some stuff about pastors earlier. I'm not going to say it this time. I'm I'm, going to move on just a little bit. No, I'm going to say it. You're here. You might as well get it. I, I am, I'm up to here with pastors and people who preach the gospel 
and act like they're above it. We live in a world where, where pastors think they can live how they want and then get behind the pulpit to preach the word of God. And they fail to follow the protocol of the tabernacle. They've, they've failed to prepare their hearts before the Lord. And so now we have pastors who literally abuse their spouse and then try to pastor a church. We have, we have pastors who neglect their family and then try to reach the world. We have, we have pastors who get addicted to drugs and alcohol and pornography and then try to get behind their pulpits and set the captive free. They stand behind their pulpits and then wonder why no one's getting saved in their churches and why their church isn't growing. And, and now we have pastors who don't even tithe and then wonder why their church is broke. Here's what I'm saying. If we want our churches to be used to change the world, our pastors must first follow the protocol and spend some time at the labor and allow God to cleanse them from unrighteousness and prepare their hearts to be prepared to do God's work. If you're looking for a pastor who's going to stay at the labor, that's me. I'm going to. In the Old Testament, the priests had to wash at the labor before they served. Before they handled the bread which represents the word of God. And with this, God's saying, go wash your hands. Spoiler alert, this isn't just for pastors. In the Old Testament, it was just for priests. But I'm talking to every believer in Christ now. You've been given access because of Jesus. God wants us to have clean hands when we come before him. So let me just park it for a second and help you understand something real quick. Washing your hands spiritually and preparing your heart and understanding consecration and sanctification has nothing to do with the style of clothes that you wear. And it has nothing to do with whether you wear makeup or not. So before we leave today, let me just make sure that I've had a chance to offend at least one person. It's not a successful avenue service unless I've offended somebody. Preparing your heart has nothing to do with you having a tattoo or not. Or if you have eight earrings or not. Or if you dye your hair crazy colors. It has nothing to do with whether you shop at Walmart, Kohl's, or Gucci. It has nothing to do with whether you wear jeans or a suit. Honey, I don't care what you wear. Just wear something. Cover all that up. I'm so sick of religious people who know just enough of the Bible to be ignorant and want to judge people by the way they look, yet themselves have a heart full of sin. Newsflash, God's not looking for you to look the part. He's looking for those who will walk the walk and talk the talk. God's looking for a church who will allow Him to purify their hearts. So let me help you out. God is not interested to see if you line up with the world. He's interested to see if you line up with His Word. Here's what I'm saying. Stay with me so I'll shut up. That's not what I'm saying, but go ahead and do it. What I'm saying is that we need to spend some time at the labor and allow His Word prepare our hearts so we can come close to God. So here's, the, here's the, the question that I want you to ask yourself. Don't answer this out loud. It'll make us all feel weird. Here's a question I want you to process in your life. Where in my life am I not lining up with God's Word? Not where does God's Word justify the way that I feel where in my life am I not lining up with God's Word notice the labor is after the altar but before the holy place why is that important you've been made right with God at the altar but it's here at the labor that you must prepare your heart so you can get close to God 
Why, why is that important? 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are also in trouble. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, God's looking for some people who've been there and done that. Who've lived life long enough to experience some stuff. And you've seen the faithfulness of God. And you've allowed him to turn what was meant for evil into your good. You've allowed him to turn your pain into power. Your test into a testimony. Your mess into a message of the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. Check this avenue. The altar is where you give up your sins. The labor is where you prepare your heart to serve. So you can help others. Exodus 38, verse 8. God's word is so good. They made the bronze basin and its bronze stand from the mirrors of the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Meeting. So mirrors look different than they do now. But these priests would walk up to the laver and everywhere they looked they could see themselves when they went to wash the blood in the laver they would see themselves don't you know that in that moment as they were washing this blood off they were realizing what it was that this blood was covering that it was for the forgiveness of all the people's sin and in this moment they would receive a reflection of themselves when was the last time you stood before the mirror and checked yourself out spiritually we're pros at looking in the mirror, checking ourselves out physically so that when we walk away from it, we think everybody else thinks we look good. But when was the last time you stood before the mirror, to, mirror spiritually speaking, and made sure you look good for God? We're so consumed and concerned about what we look like on the outside. When was the last time we came to the labor and said, Lord, search me and know me. And if there is anything in me that is not of you, take it from me. I'm thankful that you've forgiven me, but now I want to be close to you. Now, if I want to come into your presence, I, I need to prepare my heart to serve James 1, 23 and 25 says, anyone who listens to the word, you've just heard it all this morning, but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what, he has heard, what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. How are you lining up? Are you serving God right? I want to be close to God. Do you? Because if you want to be close to God, you're going to spend some time with the labor. And, and, and before we leave, can we just spiritually take a moment and spend some time at the labor? Psalm 24, 3 and 4. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? In other words, who can level up? Who can, who can step into what God has for them? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So here's... Here's a big idea. The altar and the laver are where your past dies and your future begins. Here it is, Avenue. Life is so much better when you're serving God. So much better. Two things I want us to do real quick. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing at the avenue. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You'll hear me say this a lot if you come to the avenue enough. I am, I am begging you, please don't go to hell. Please don't go to hell. Please make it to heaven. Like it's, why, would you, why would you go to hell when heaven's been made so easy? When Jesus became the ultimate sacrifice for your sins. See, it, it's real easy. It's real easy to pray your prayer because you feel bad about what you've done, but it's another thing to live it. Like, live it. Lord, there'll be many that stand before me, he says, and Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we cast out demons and heal the sick and prophesy in your name? And Jesus said, I'll, I'll have to look at you and say, depart from me. I don't know you. I never knew you. Church people, church people. Please, please don't go to hell. If you, go, if you end up in hell, it's because you chose to go there. Please don't go there. Jesus took your place. Let's, let's start there. With, so with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one moving, no one looking, just our prayer team. If that's you, you're standing here today saying, you know what, I don't, I don't know where I'm going to end up. I don't know if something happened. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I have Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe, maybe you've walked away from God. Maybe today it needs to be a recommitment for you. But right here in this moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you, you say, Pastor Justin, include me in that prayer. I need God in my life. Right, just, I want to pray with you right there where you're standing. So on the count of three, if that's you, if you be honest with yourself, honest with me, honest with God, if that's you, just so I know who I'm praying with, on the count of three, just lift up that hand. Come on, one, two. Come on, you want life and not death, heaven, not hell. Come on, three, lift that hand up. Yeah, thank you, yeah, thank you. Thank you, yeah, yeah, right here. Praise God, right there. If, if that was you, just real quick, do it again so I can see you. Just real quick, just real quick. Just look. Yeah, I see it. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Those of you lifting that hand, I want you to pray this from your heart and from your mouth. Avenue, let's join them. I want you to say, Jesus, I need you. I'm hopeless without you. I'm lost without you. Thank you for dying for me and rising again. Jesus, you are Lord. Forgive me of my sins. And from this day forward, I'm not running from you. I'm running to you because you love me and you're my Savior in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody shout a big amen right there. If this message spoke to you today and you took your next step of making a decision to know Christ, we want to celebrate with you and walk this out with you. Simply click the link in the comments below and a pastor will reach out to you and celebrate the greatest decision you have ever made. At The Avenue, we know that we're stronger together, everyone matters, and you belong here.